Hello everybody, welcome to Totally Tabled. My name is Shaggy, and today I'm giving my first impressions of Batoku. I really want to emphasize first impressions here, because I've only played the game twice, both times at solo, so I lack the experience to speak with any sort of authority on this game. I'm merely giving you my first impressions, my initial feelings. Please take everything I say, both good and bad, with a grain of salt, and go watch the playthrough. I did a full playthrough of the first round of the game, and then I skipped ahead to the final scoring. I'm going to assume you've either played the game or you've seen that playthrough. There's a lot to talk about with this one, so I want to dive right into the gameplay itself. I was really excited to play this one for a couple of reasons. One, just the look of it. Bright and colorful, great artwork. Uh, it just it looked like a lot of fun, you know, especially for a Euro game where, you know, it tends to be a little drab. This seemed bright and exciting. So that was the first thing that appealed to me. The second, though, was it featured dice worker placement, and I love that mechanism. So this one was definitely high on my list to try out. And as far as that sort of the heart of the gameplay here, I really like it. The idea of, you know, using those amulets to increase the power of your worker, sending them out, the higher the number, the better stuff you get. That's a great system. The idea of having these cards that give you little bonuses and you play the cards to unlock the dice adds a little bit of subtle timing. There's some powers that let you unlock those dice early so you can get those worker placement spots before other people. And then the added sort of two-step worker placement where once you've placed a worker, you can then move it across the river to get an additional benefit. You weaken that worker a little bit and you also free up a worker placement spot for someone else to come in. Again, adding to that timing, there's a little bit of a, of a subtle strategy to the timing of placing things and how you're unlocking things. So it's clever in that way, and I think it works really well. My only wish, I, I guess, is that maybe the worker placement spots across the river were a little bit more interesting. Maybe something where, you know, the value that you place there has some impact, just like in the first worker placement spot like maybe you can decide how much you reduce the die and you get bigger benefits or something like that i kind of wanted those spaces to be just as exciting as uh, you know the the spaces on the other side of the river and also just losing one i like the fact that if you place a six you then have to spin it down to a three right that's good and that that's a good decision spinning it down just one wasn't that much of a penalty and i don't know if it was just the 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 layout the randomized layout of of my two games i never really had trouble getting amulets in order to bump up those dice so i was rarely i don't think i ever placed a die that was less than a four and so losing one space to go across the river, you get it back, it was easy to bump it back up into the four, five, and six, and mostly just six. I mean, even just losing three, it's not that hard to bump it up to a six. Maybe if the tiles come out a little differently, it would be a little harder to do that. And so maybe that was just a function of the particular game I'm playing. It might have been a little more interesting, I think, if it was more difficult to increase those dice. But again, that's minor. Overall, that system is really great. And that's really the heart of what's going on here. And I like it. I think it's I think it works really well. And a couple of negatives here. One is the rule book. You know, anytime I do a playthrough on the channel, I learn the rules through the rule book. That's just how I do it. Uh, I love watching playthrough videos and stuff like that, but I want to read the rule book. And, you know, so if I'm going to make a mistake, it's going to be because of, you know, a mistake that I made not reading the rules properly rather than watching a video of someone else's mistake. You know, learning the game through that rule book was a struggle for me. And I usually don't struggle with it. I've you know, learned a thousand different games, reading a thousand different rule books, literally. And this was a struggle, mostly because... Of, of one thing that I is really a bugaboo for me, and that is so much jargon. You know, the theme here, they're clearly very proud of this theme, and it's inspired by actual mythology, but, you know, this world that they've created is, is sort of made up, and the rule book is just littered with jargon, which I now know, but when you're learning the game, figuring out the difference between a uh, Botoku and a, a Yokai and a Kadama and, you know, just on and on and on. Every worker placement area 
has a different name and they use that name and it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to piece together what they're talking about they don't offer you any sort of help in that way you have to constantly be hunting around like okay what what is that again i i found the jargon overwhelming and it really complicated learning just the base rules that gets compounded by the fact that you have an additional set of solo rules that is nearly as much as just the base rules Maybe it's because I'm a writer, a, a journalist by trade, that I'm a little more sensitive to this sort of thing. You need to write in such a way to help the player. When you're writing rules for the, you know, an AI opponent, you need to explain to the player the motivations of the AI, not just the what the AI is going to do, but the why. Ooh, they're going to prioritize unlocking a die in this situation. Oh, they're only going to cross the river if they can get their favorite card. Otherwise, they're going to try to block up all the spaces. Things like that. Something that helps us get into the mindset. The other issue is I find the board to be incredibly hard to read. You have extremely tiny icons everywhere. And then you have a board that is beautiful when hanging on the wall, but really becomes you know a problem when you're trying to you know, identify and locate and, and just read a board state. You know, it's it's like trying to listen to a conversation and there's 10 other conversations going around. It becomes this cacophony and you have to struggle to focus and all that extra mental energy that's being put into just trying to make the board go away so you can see these tiny icons. It creates a kind of mental fatigue again, <laughs> like it makes you feel like you're playing something heavier than it is. And it's just because there's a there's a lack of readability. Now, of course, now after two games, it's a lot easier. And, you know, that's always the go-to excuse. Like, well, you know, you get used to it. Well, sure, you can get used to anything. I mean, that's that's a, a, the nature of a human being is that we get used to almost anything. Th that shouldn't be an excuse. Yeah, if you, if you play this game every day, um, you'll get used to all this stuff. Initially, it's a real struggle. And it, it kind of sours the, the initial experience. That's a negative. And again, your mileage may vary for both of these things, right? For anything that I'm saying, your mileage may vary. My other little nitpick here would just just sort of the base rules. We have I'm not talking about the solo game yet. I'm going to get there. But just with the base rules is this is not a very streamlined experience. And by that I mean there are a lot of little tiny rules exceptions. A lot of little things that you have to kind of remember. Not a, you know everything works a little bit differently. You know like. Let's talk about the, the dragonfly tiles and those spirit tiles, right? The spirit tile, the bottom tile, as I like to call it, you get the reward right away. You also get victory points. Let me tell you, it's hard to remember that you get victory points when you take one of those tiles. It's written on the board there, sure, but like nothing else does that. That's the one tile where you get those immediate victory points and it's written there on the board. It's very hard to remember that. Also, you, you get the reward right away. With the dragonfly, nope. No points. You don't get the reward unless you pair them together. Then you get the reward. You don't have to pair them together, but you can, but you have to decide immediately. It, it, that whole thing is very messy, and I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why it's like that. It just, that's not adding a lot of strategy. The, you know, the fact that, you know, that decision about whether to combine them or not is based on the fact that some of those vision cards, can, you can score points at the end of the game for having leftover unmatched dragonfly and spirit tiles. And it's like that, I don't know, I found that whole thing to be a little bit annoying. You could have solved all that by just having the vision cards just let you score for combined ones, right? And then you just always combine them when you can. And it would just be cleaner, right? I, it, when you have something this clunky, there needs to be a strong reason why. And there just really isn't. And also, the frustrating thing is these two tiles don't have anything to do with one another. Like, if you're going to have a mechanism like that, have these two tiles have some relationship with one another. You know, maybe you have to match types, right? Like, so you have to match a red with a red. Or if you combine them in certain ways, you get different things. And you can get better combinations to get more things. Something where they relate to one another. But here, they're just completely different tiles, and the only reason you're putting them together is so that you can get one of the benefits from one of them. 
So this is an instance where I think you both have an opportunity to streamline a sort of clunky, fiddly rule. And also you have a missed opportunity to do something a little bit more interesting. You know, it's like an illusion of complexity here. Like with the resources, there's four different types of resources and I can't quite figure out why because they're mostly the same. Anytime you're getting resources, you're, you have a choice of which one to take, which of the four to take. You know, it's never like I'm going here to get wood. I'm, you know, you, you're for the most part, except in very rare circumstances, you can pretty much get what you want. And the only difference in spending resources is buildings cost wood and stone, sometimes wood, sometimes stone, sometimes both. Half the time you're getting a discount anyway. So when it's both, you can just pick one or the other. And then the spirit tiles, right? It's either sake or jade or both. You know, so really there could have been two resources or really even just one. I don't know, there's just, there's something missing there. Like, you know, in a game like, like the Lost Ruins of Arnak, there are various different resources, but you have to go to specific places to get specific resources and collecting the right combination of resources to, to go to the spot and do the thing that you want to do is a big part of the game. Here, that's not really what it is. That, it feel, that feels like an area that should have been streamlined in some way. Or if you're going to have four resources, have it be meaningful. There's a lot of little things like that here. When you just, when you start to drill down, you question why things are the way that they are. It seems like it, things could have been either simplified or those areas could have been enhanced in some way. These are just little odd little moments of friction that I would feel as I was playing. You know, just rub up against something like that and be like, you know, why, why, why is that like that? There's just a lot of little rules. And that's particularly true with the solo mode. Let's talk about the solo mode. I really want you to <laughs> go and watch the playthrough so you can see the solo mode in action, so you understand where I'm coming from. And in fact, if you watched my top 10 solo games, what I'm about to say is probably not going to be too much of a surprise because I think it's pretty clear in that top 10 video the kind of solo mode that I like. And that is a simplified, streamlined solo mode. And that is obviously not what this is. This is a fairly involved, complicated, Automa style solo opponent where you are going through many steps and really having to grind on uh, the decisions that they're making. And again, let me be clear, after two games of this, I got much better at figuring out what the solo opponent should do. It got a lot quicker, but even still, your solo opponent's turn is taking two to four times as long as your turn. It, it just is. You know, I got good at maybe identifying what action they were going to take because you can skip over some of those. And I showed that in the playthrough, right? You can sort of skip over the first three pretty easily, you know, just by looking at their state. But I continued to struggle with exactly what action they were going to take. When were they going to spend a resource? When were they going to move their Kodama? Because sometimes they move the Kodama, sometimes they don't. Figuring out like... When is it random, the tile that they're going to take? Or when is there sort of a hierarchy, like with the buildings? Where are they going to put the building exactly? Some of this stuff I, I continued to struggle with and I continued to have to consult the chart. I mean, you got to play this game with, with the chart, you know, in your lap. And that's just simply not the kind of solo mode that I enjoy. And this is a huge your mileage may vary because I know that there are solo players who are really good at doing that and maybe even enjoy it because, you know, the upside is that the solo opponent is behaving in a much more intelligent fashion. So you're getting a much more challenging opponent. Uh, the problem is you're having to grind through it to, to make it happen. Other people are not going to have a problem with this. You know, if you're used to this sort of thing, if you enjoy this sort of thing, this is probably on the on the you know lighter or medium side of that compared to some other games. This might be right up your alley. This might be a positive for you. It's just me as a solo player because you know I don't just play solo. I play multiplayer games, and for me, Batoku fits squarely into the like I really want to play this at three players. To me, this is like a super solid three-player game. 
and I'm not going to come back to the solo. This is not one that I'm going to be pulling off the shelf for solo, uh, just, just because of my own personal preferences. It works and it's intelligently done. And if you have more tolerance for, you know, chart, <laughs> chart reading, then you might enjoy it. I would recommend trying it out for sure, because I think this is a great game. It's it just, you know, this this gives me a little bit of a feel. They're very different games, but it gives me a little bit of a feel of The Lost Ruins of Arnak, you know, with the worker placement mixed with some super light deck building, not really deck building, really light deck building. It has a little bit of that feel, except with Arnak, that thing is streamlined to the max. The experience is incredibly smooth and playing it solo, super smooth. And I would pull that off the shelf for solo you know, 10 out of 10 times over this. So there you go. Those are my initial impressions of Botoku. I simply haven't played enough to give any sort of rating, so I'm not going to. Playing a game twice solo is just not enough to to really be able to talk definitively about anything, as I said before. So uh, this is this is one that I recommend trying for sure. And I think if you watch the playthrough and it looks interesting to you, you should definitely give it a go. There you go. Thank you so much for listening. And goodbye.